Okay, welcome to the lecture on the California State Legislature. This is our state legislative branch. So let's talk about the design, purpose, and function of our legislature. A lot of this is going to come you know, sim and be similar to the federal constitution. So California has a system of separate pa separated powers. The legislature makes laws or policy. The executive enforces the laws and implements policy, and the judicial branch interprets the law. We have a bicameral structure of our legislature, just like the federal Congress. In California, we do call the we have two houses. One is the Senate, and the other is the Assembly. Members and term lengths in the Assembly and Senate. The lower house, which is the Assembly, has 80 members that serve two-year terms. The upper house, the Senate, has 40 members that serve four-year terms. Um, so the representation of the most populous districts, you know, legislators in both houses represent districts that are among the most populous in the nation. 80 assembly districts have almost a half million constituents, and 40 Senate districts have almost 1 million and are larger than 52 of U.S. House districts across the country. You know, a constituent, if you guys don't know, right, a constitu constituent is a person who resides in a district that is represented by the elected official. California has a professionalized state legislature, meaning that they are full-time employees, they have a staff, and they have a budget. The, you know, the, the members of the California legislature, they fight hard, they have extensive campaigns, and they meet year-round. California has term limits. You know, since 2012, members can serve a total of 12 years in a single house or can split their time between the Assembly and the Senate. So the, since 2022, these term limits have actually, you know, the turnover didn't really start happening until 2022. And we've seen steady turnover since then when people started hitting um, their limits. So some of the current trends in our assembly and our Senate, the legislators tend to stay in office and build their expertise, you know, wait longer to scout their next jobs, and want to tackle big picture issues and long-term projects. The Senate is attracting first-time legislators rather than the former assembly, which really helps equalize the chambers because we're getting people, you know, freshman, con you know, senators on both sides. The idea of redistricting is always so important. The process of, re, you know, of redrawing these lines is done by the Citizen Commission instead of by the legislature. Um, you know, redistricting process, this independent commission um, rebuilds these, you know, redistricts after the Senate every 10 years. And California is one of 15 states to actually allocate this redistricting power, you know, to someone outside of the reg regular legislative body. So this commission, the Re California Redistricting Commission, it is a politically balanced and demographically diverse committee. It's a 14-member commission um, constituted through a multi-stage process. And they draw all of these board, you know, these redistricting lines, these districts, based on a strict nonpartisan rules designated to ensure fairness. So these nonpartisan rules, we have nonpartisan rules to prevent gerrymandering. Remember, gerrymandering is the way that they redraw districts in a discriminatory fashion. So the ger these rules mandate equal population in the districts. They aim to keep communities of interest intact and eliminate protections for incumbents and political partisanship. And virtually every aspect is open and participatory because the more transparent we are, the less likely there are for, you know, problems to occur. You know, this redistricting process, it, it, it is inherently messy, but it has survived court challenges. So in 2021, the commission undertook extensive public education and outreach through social media and public meetings and received over 36,000 comments and held long, difficult debates over where to draw boundary lines. Um, 
So Democrats do tend to dominate most districts. You'll see California really does skew blue. Um, and Temecula is one of the areas, and Riverside County is one of the more red areas of the state. So we do have a persistence of anti-politician, anti-government sentiment. You know, and despite the fact that hundreds of public-spirited men and women serve you know, honorably as state legislators, people are still not really happy with the way the government's working. So what do California's representatives do at work? So, you know, we talked in the prior you know, lectures about partisanship and the progressivism. You know, California has come a long way since then. You know, California's legislators are actually some of the highest paid in the country. There still is a lot of special interest, and that simply is because they're the ones who have the funds to effectuate change in the legislature. So we do have that Democratic supermajority in both chambers. So it is difficult for any Republican votes to be had. The majority party you know, comprises at least two-thirds or more of the membership. So rather than finding a few Republican votes, now Democratic leaders manage the factions within their Democratic majority, and as they usually need to persuade moderate, business-friendly Democrats to support the party's agenda. It's, you know, they have the power, because it is a supermajority, to overcome the governor's veto if he tries to veto. We do have, it is supposed to, there are some bipartisanship, you know, despite poor differences, um, members of the, both parties do try to work together in committees, they socialize outside of work, and often agree on problems because they do want to, you know, help the greater good of the state of California. Every term, hundreds of bills are passed on consent or unanimously. Our legislator does reflect the diversity of the state of California. We have, <clears throat> since 2016-2017, over half of all assembly members identified as racial or ethnic minorities, rendering a majority-minority chamber. Uh, however, the Senate does remain mostly white. The number of women, you know, had its begun rising in the mid-70s, but their numbers have fluctuated in recent years. As of 2022, there were eight members of the LGBTQ caucus, which was the first of its kind to be officially recognized by a state legislature. So our, you know, obviously their job is lawmaking and policymaking. So the representative functions of assembly members and senates, senators. They perform various aspects of lawmaking and policymaking. They deal with about 5,000 bills and measures introduced in a two-year period. They rely on their staffers to gather information, listen to colleagues, hear arguments, mostly from lobbyists, about proposed laws, and visit schools and businesses to interact and get a better sense of their districts. They need to know what's going on so they can better you know, represent their people. They introduce bills to address problems that lobbyists or constituents bring to their attention. These bills could become new statutes, and they're referred to as legislative proposals. Proposed legislation, pieces of legislation, or simply legislation as they move through the lawmaking process. You know, they want to help shape or amend legislation. As committee members, they amend legislation after hearing from government employees, experts, and other witnesses who will potentially be affected by proposed changes. And then they deliberate and vote on bills. They do so first in committee, then on the assembly or senate floor, where every member gets to vote on every piece of legislation. As all bills must be passed in identical form by both houses before sending to the governor for a signature or veto, members also will support for, or opposition to, measures moving through the other house. You know, the bulk of our lawmaking is done with, through what's called a standing committee. There are 33 Assembly and 22 Senate Policy and Fiscal Committees. Eligible members of the majority party become a chair if they desire. These committees meet regularly and are permanently staffed by policy specialists who have knowledge of policy solutions that allow them to analyze and shape the bills referred. These bills are then debated in a public hearing. After a bill is referred to a committee, the chair usually schedules a hearing where the author, lobbyists, 
government officials, and others may provide information and arguments for and against it. Lobbyists often suggest changes to these bills to accommodate their clients' concerns. Bills may be heard in committee for debate and discussion, even if they are unlikely to succeed. Bills that are problematic may be held or set aside at either of the author or the chair's request. The committee votes and they finalize the language. Um, there are either you know, future hearings on it or then they vote. And then the process is repeated in the other house. After that, the bill is chartered. After any differences are resolved, both chambers vote on the bill and send it to the governor for a signature or veto. If the governor signs the bill, it does become law. So power is no longer concentrated with committee chairs. You know, or, you know, earlier, committee chairmen would protect pet projects. They would crush bills at a whim and bless others before releasing them for final consideration. This steeper turnover because of the term limits leads to relatively less expert members. Many freshmen without legislative experience have chaired committees under term limits. The perspective is informed chiefly by their experience outside of San Francisco, Sacramento because they're freshmen. They don't you know, have that experience. Bills are now shaped by several factors, players, rules, and timing. Uh, throughout the bill passage, you know, the process, stakeholders voice their concerns. They demand or plead for accommodation. Legislators weigh all inputs and respond by amending details or by killing bills entirely. Special interests may wield overt influence over, over these bills. Lawmakers tend to be extra sensitive to fears and threats of wealth finance, vocal influential entities that support their political party or are active in the districts. There is the impact of relationships and caucuses. Partisans tend to follow to support fellow partisans, but legislators who share special interests might become allies even across the aisle. Aside from the party caucuses in both houses, other caucuses enable bipartisan collaboration on related issues. You know, these caucuses must be based on can be demographic based, mutual interest, or re region based. We also have the development of social capital over time. Representatives tend to develop a shared sense of norms, impersonal network, and trust among colleagues. So the bills that are being made, they vary in scope, cost, urgency, and significance. Regular bills are given a designation Assembly Bill or Senate Bill, AB or SB. Um, of lowest significance but highly symbolic are simple resolutions to express the legislator's position on particular issues. Inexpensive district bills that deal with local concerns usually only have minor impacts on the state government. Some relate to the administration of government and make amendments to existing state law. These proposed statutes might impose mandates on local governments or agencies or private businesses. Some create new programs, they define crimes, suggest constitutional amendments, or create pilot programs that allow policies to be tested. An example of would be the California Environmental Quality Act. And this was in 1970. This act requires state and local agencies to identify the significant environmental impacts of their actions and to avoid or mitigate them. These codes have profound impacts on infrastructure development, including the design, size, cost, location, and time of completion of projects like apartment buildings, airport expansions, and water storage. This is this act is partly to blame for our growing housing shortage. Strict regulations have caused rising property development costs, placed some areas off limits to development, and delayed construction projects by tying them up in court. Congress also needs to, you know, the Senate needs to address big ticket items. Um, bills that have multi-million dollar impacts tend to demand intricate knowledge of existing law. They affect many different groups and usually require years of preparation, study, and compromise. Issues take years and inputs of many stakeholders to try and solve. These are issues like homelessness, workers' compensation benefits, reshaping health care to comply with federal legislation. It's the tough stuff. You know, legislators rely heavily on their staff. These personal staff work inside each of the capital and district offices to analyze and prepare bills, assist with scheduling, and connect with constituents and lobbyists. 
These professional committee staff members or consultants work for a specific committee and manage all aspects of shepherding bills through the process from scheduling witnesses for committee hearings to writing detailed analysis of bills. Staff work you know, for both parties' leadership and routinely provide their own bill analysis and vote recommendations for party proposals. They have institutional housekeepers like the Assembly Chief Clerk or the Senate Secretary that ensure the legislators follow standing rules and parliamentary procedures. There's always one rule administrator. You know, we do have offices like the Legislative Analyst Office and Legislative Council. Those are going to be your policy analysts that help, you know, explain things and look at the, you know, are the laws constitutional? Uh, Policy-wise, what is the implication going to be? Very important. So the majority party does control the fate of our bills. We have a simple majority vote, which would be 41 in the Assembly, 21 in the Senate, as all that's needed to post, pass most bills in the annual judgment. So the majority party can't enact its agenda without being held hostage by the minority party. Um, the supermajority is would be 54 in the Assembly and 27 in the Senate. So this would put the Republicans in a rather discouraging position. Um, but even though the Republicans are kind of in a bind, they do contribute to the process. They keep the majority party accountable by raising pointed questions in committee hearings and voicing concerns during floor debates, by shaping their, their bills to attract consensus, by trying to amend the majority's bills to soften potential impacts on their decision and publicly challenging the acts of the majority. So one of the important things that the California legislature does is they um, do the state budget. I remember a time when there was the budget issues with Governor Schwarzenegger, you know, that they would actually lock them in Congress to solve the budget problems. They'd spend the night. Kind of something we would want, you know. Um, you know, def so we have to define the fiscal year. The fiscal year in the state of California starts July 1st and ends the following June 30th. The process formally begins on or about before January 10th when the governor submits a preliminary version to the legislator and it should end by June 15th when the budget is officially due. So, you know, we budget for government programs between the divided, and it does divide both houses. Everyone has, you know, different programs that they care about and they really want funded. During the winter and spring, budget committees and subcommittees determine how much money is needed to keep these programs running. They use the governor's budget as a benchmark for estimating costs and potential revenues. So, you know, we divide the budget into clauses. Um, big ticket items like education are either automatically funded or like basic health care services and prisons are permanent commitments, leaving a smaller chunk for discretionary spending. Just like any budget, right? So we do have a state appropriations limit when we're dealing with the budget, and that is a cap on state spending that is set by a complex formula. Don't ask me to explain that. I'm not good with numbers. When the budget surplus arose in 2022, legislators and the governors sparred over how they wanted to, to, to deal with that. If you recall in 2022, I believe that's when we got the um, California Golden State Stimulus to return that money back into the economy. You know, budgeting during economic downturns, the process becomes incendiary as painful cuts become necessary and lawmakers pivot to protect their favorite programs and principles. Um, you know, they, if there's not enough money coming in, what do they do, right? Um, yeah, this anxiety is tempered by trust when there's a trifecta, and this is what's going on right now in California, because the House and the both houses of the legislature are ran by the Democrats, and the governor is a Democrat. So, you know, the end of the budgeting process by June 30th. So the budget wraps up after the Assembly Speaker and Senate President Pro Tem, the governor and their staff, you know, sign the budget into law. Luckily in California, we never, we don't run into that problem like we feel at the federal level of, oh, we have a government shutdown. So an important role of the legislature is constituency, service, and outreach. 
So they have, you know, constituents need help navigating the government system. That is what your representative should be doing for you. Um, this is particularly useful when the constituents' troubles stem from bureaucratic red tape. So the staff members of the legislature, you know, they help respond quickly to requests. Then there's caseworkers who typically work in these district offices, track down and assist from administrators and state agencies, and schedule appointments for constituents. This helps make the government seem friendly because, you know, you have someone who's actually going to help you who's there to, for you. Um, the legislature also communicates its accomplishments through energetic outreach efforts and promoting their problem solving. They do this on social media, email, web blasts, and meetings, stuff like that. And this helps reinforce, you know, re-elections because name recognition is everything. The legislature also provides executive branch oversight. They have monitoring programs to ensure that a law is being carried out according to the legislator's intent. And then they can review and question administrators or have investigative reports so people can be subpoenaed to come before a standing committee. We do have ways, you know, they have ways to re rescue the legislative intent. It's always important to look at these laws to see what was the intent of the legislature when they signed this into law? Is this what they wanted? So, you know, they can rescue this intent by following up with the offending administrator in person or write a bill to clear up confusion. You'll see that sometimes when you do look at laws. So then they also have the ability to directly appoint to boards and commissions. So this is different um, than at the federal level. The Senate can influence programs by confirming appointments to go for governor appointees to major executive departments and influence full state boards and commissions. Um, the leaders, this is where it's different than the federal level, leaders in both houses have the ability to directly appoint people uh, to these boards. So we have the leaders of California's government, right? We have the big five, that's the governor, minority leaders of each house, the speaker of the assembly, and the president pro tem, some of the Senate. We have, you know, they speak for their fellow party members and yeah. assist with last minute cobbling together of bargains. We have the big three Democratic leaders. These are the top two legislative leaders plus the governor. They are most visible and central to the process as Republicans lack the power to change the outcome. You know, a party leader's job is to retain or regain that majority status. They want to maintain what they have. And they also help shape the agenda. They can rally the troops. We also want these leaders that have the ability to, to obtain desired outcomes. This goes on the leadership style to see if they can reduce office budgets, if they can, you know, get everyone to cooperate with them. The role of the speaker does have various leadership styles. Most visible, the speaker is the most visible member of the assembly and spokesperson at large. They're one of the chief negotiators. So currently we have Speaker Anthony Rendon. He's elected to be a hands-off leader, unlike his predecessor who had a, had a hand. You know, we talk about the clout of the Speaker versus the Senate pro tem. They're more or less equal under revised term limits. And the Speaker appoints chairs and members to all assembly committees, as does the President pro tem. They're very similar, right? Um, staying in power, leaders never forget that they were chosen by, must never forget that they were chosen by their constituents. Tyrants should not survive. So that is the California State Legislature. Thank you.